So, how might we link this understanding of denial and dissociation in the failed witness position with the idea of being socially implicated, even though they are not exactly the same? How do we link therapeutic treatment with individuals or work with groups who have suffered in the past to those present injuries occurring in real time that speak to our unconscious guilt, our complicity, and our failure to take full responsibility for the society we belong to. We are not only politically responsible as citizens to repair historical damage and oppose the present harm. That's an idea that Rothberg proposes in reflecting on Arendt. Uh, so, um, hang on one second. We are also implicated insofar as our tacit acceptance of the psychic culture and the social benefits of harming. Our acquiescence in states of denial, as Stanley Cohen called it, provides a vital, indeed indispensable part of the orderly procedures that support systems of domination. Now, let me back up and say a few words about my version of recognition theory, which, as I said, you can find in my new book or in the article I mentioned. In light of clinical experience, it seemed useful to me to elaborate the idea of the intersubjective third as a position beyond doer and done to. This would mean holding in tension the binaries that have been split. Instead of mere reversal, the third is what we call a dialectical move out of cycles of victims becoming perpetrator. The third represents corresponding internal and relational positions in which we are or see ourselves as like subjects, not a reactive position, but active in recognition of the impact of the other. This deconstructive view of complementary relations and polarities aim to go beyond the reversal in which the other is exalted and gains power over the previously dominant ones while maintaining the binary opposition of domination. Accordingly, we can distinguish forms of seeking justice or redress of collective trauma that preserve the binary opposition between doer and done to, such forms often including serious violence and destruction, from those that occur in the context of a mutually recognizing third. I've also proposed a further iteration of the third, which I call the moral third. It builds on the idea of reciprocal recognition by adding the specific acknowledgement of relational and social violations. The affirmation of violations of expectancy and the wrong things that need to be put right can become the basis for the experience that we could call the lawful world, an experience that I believe begins already in infancy when violations of expectation are redressed. A representation of the lawful world evolves, therefore, within the early dyadic communicative matrix. It psychologically undergirds our practices of justice and witnessing. Even when individuals <clears throat> or collective loss and injury lie in the past and cannot be undone, the acknowledgement of those injuries can establish the moral third. This allows the injured ones to reconstitute their sense of dignity and take action to repair damage through their own agency. So to be a witness and more importantly, an embodied witness is to break through the disidentification that says 
This injured person is different, less human. This is one of the ways we can repair our own sense of helplessness in the face of catastrophe, something many of us are feeling right now. Seeing ourselves as having the ability to recognize the other's humanity, countering the tendency to dissociate our own vulnerability from that of the other can become the basis for acknowledging and psychically repairing injustice, injury, or wrongdoing. This of course does require the psychological toleration of vulnerability, which was just mentioned. And this tolerance of vulnerability is actually a condition of giving recognition. Even as the fact that we've received such recognition is a condition of such tolerance. Our bodies and our nervous systems require this recognition to sustain our connectedness to other humans as a fundamental basis of safety and attachment. Only when we experience that third can we begin to subjectively encompass the meaning of taking responsibility for our implication and for the fate of the other who is dependent upon us, which is to say, to acknowledge, to repair, and to restore the social bonds of connection based on mutual respect will create a very different kind of safety and sense of self than the one that submits to or aligns with power. Now let me talk a little bit about implication in terms of what the study of clinical enactment has revealed and how we relational analysts see this. As relational psychoanalysts, we've introduced a process of reflection on the clinical version of being implicated, one in which we are drawn into reenacting trauma and seeking relational repair together with the patient. In that context, we came to realize that the frequently seen reaction of psychoanalysts in the past, their initial denial or defensiveness regarding their own behavior, indeed not just initial, but often remaining stuck in that, might be attributed to entering what Bromberg called the dissociative cocoon. That was his description of the, counter, of the envelope of counter-transference. This means that we could trace ruptures and impasses in psychoanalytic therapies to a confluence of our patients and of our own dissociative processes and histories. Relational analysis revived and took seriously Ferenczi's realization that inevitably we repeat a version of earlier traumatic injuries, even though we have engaged as analysts and sincerely are devoted to healing them. The analysts may even become implicated by adopting a neutral professional stance, Ferenczi said, creating distance and reactivating the patient's sense of abandonment. So often the dedicated effort to avoid repetition, for instance, by being neutral, is exactly the thing that drives the enactment, or we might say drives the patient crazy. I have called this tendency to create the very thing we tried to prevent our appointment in Thebes. The analyst's failure to provide embodied witnessing is then registered as part of the original injury, and thus failure to witness is elided with causing injury. This in turn intensifies the analyst's guilt and can lead to impasse. We have found that therapeutic healing lies in surrendering to the inevitability of such occurrences as a process of rupture and repair. This process whereby the patient can experience the restoration or affirmation 
of a lawful world in which wrongs are put right may be compared to Winnicott's idea of surviving destruction. That is, there's an inherent link between Tronic's concept of rupture and repair and Winnicott's idea of surviving destruction. Insofar as the analyst is there to receive the communication, as Winnicott put it, to survive the knowledge of their own part in the enactment, the patient can receive recognition that their challenge, even when aggressive or disruptive at times, is an action that changes us. Changing in response to the other's impact without being overwhelmed by it is an essential aspect of recognition that the patient and in fact, we ourselves seek. We also hope that the patient not being overwhelmed means that they too survive the rupture and finally the third itself survives. I see in the tension between enacting failure and changing in response to it, a possible parallel process for implicated subjects. To give acknowledgement and change in response to the other requires a form of vulnerability, a surrender of self-protection. While these orientations are usually held in different self-states that are dissociated from one another, rather than experience as conflict, it is possible to survive the confrontation with vulnerability by accepting that our self-protection has become a problem. Indeed, it's a problem common to us all. So what is it that allows us to know both states, surrender and self-protection, as me? Bromberg's idea of standing in the spaces was that we recognize all parts of self as me. What allows us to admit that we are implicated in hurting or guilty of denying the other's reality of suffering while still maintaining our sense of self? As psychoanalysts, we've asked, what would allow us to destabilize our self-protective barrier and tolerate the self-exposure and vulnerability of shame and guilt? What we have found is that this cannot be done without eliciting some form of cooperation from the other who sits in the room with us. Together, we become able to build a third that holds the self-exposure, the guilt and shame of both persons, even though they are not equal and do not play a symmetrical role in creating those conditions. Interrogating what this psycho exposure entails for the analyst, we've recognized that when our goodness is in question, we are liable to become dysregulated. Or would it be more precise to say, our claim to being recognized as good now, rather than viewing this loss of imaginary goodness in the terms that we used in the past, where we believed our freedom from scrutiny, that is to say our professional power was being challenged or jeopardized in an unacceptable way, we had to develop instead an appreciation for the kind of power and connection that come from something different, from sharing our mutual vulnerability and discovering things we did not know about each other. This was a revolution in the attitude of the analyst. In other words, at some point, the position of imaginary goodness and invulnerability will inevitably be revealed as false. It will be seen to have led to a state of insecurity and disconnection from the other. In the social realm, of course, the self-protective aim of offloading shame onto the other and claiming dignity for oneself legitimates control over vital resources of status, wealth, even police protection. 
the more pernicious forms of invulnerability appear even more aggressive in this historic moment. In America in particular, we see how masculine strength or paternal authority that bases itself on the illusion of independence from the very relationship on which one depends has triggered a fight for control of the female body. I will simply note that implicated subjects who comply with and find affirmation in the culture of power should be distinguished from those whose unease with the unlawful world may yet spur them to seek an alternative. In considering what militates against implicated subjects of the, the second type, taking action on behalf of the human community to which they belong, we return to the problem of dissociation. Why do we look away? Why do we accept what is? Engaging with this question, Rothberg introduced the notion of obedience, one well known to those who study critical social theory. Indeed, the problem of obedience to authority, if not to, <clears throat> to say an, an embrace of submission to the order of things, is central. If we posit that implicated subjects who serve the originators of domination are enmeshed not only through material benefits, but by identification with the powerful ones. Identification being such an important part of understanding mass psychology since Freud. Then we might say that such subjects are doubly implicated. The subject's actions, of course, contribute to the sum total that produce harm, but they are also shaped cyclically and distorted as they mold to the structural demands of that social totality. And in this molding, they affirm their own helplessness, whether or not they consciously suffer from it. What is taken for granted in the unthinking comfort and submission to the social order is not only the privilege of belonging, but also the allegiance, perhaps unconscious and conflicted, to its principles, the identification with ideals of impermeability, self-aggrandizement and winning, not being a loser, which in the United States coincides with the imaginary of whiteness as wholeness and invulnerability. Those identifications inform the pervasive dissociation about the denigration and harm of the other. It follows that a full confrontation with that imaginary construct would show it, how it shapes a dissociated unthinking submission to the order of domination. As members of a society that has engaged in the harming and collective trauma of racial and colonial domination, we could see ourselves as implicated in those consequences, but also as formed by our compliance with the conditions that produce it. We could realize how enmeshed we are in the psychic matrix of whiteness, whose consequences we cannot help but dissociate. If participation occurs with no realization of the way one inhabits and props up structures of violence, this refers us to what Bion saw as a refusal to know. When our psychic life is unavoidably lived within identities formed in this way, thinking about or acting in opposition to the dominant order generates anxiety. Opposition demands at the least some ability to tolerate that anxiety along with awareness of suffering. Most likely, opposition also involves critical self-reflection on how these identities have deformed us psychically. We might consider such reflection as the beginning of a liberatory practice that we as clinicians can embrace. This is because there where we deny participating, we are most likely to submit to purposes, 
and structures we imagine ourselves free of. In fact, we could say that passivity, obedience, and consent to authority deriving from the Christian tradition has functioned to create an acquiescence, as Forty argued, which forms the core of what is known as democratic virtue and the transmission belt of political evil. Such analysis of implication parallels what I said previously about how we understand our effort to main, maintain our sense of goodness at all costs. In quotidian life under regimes of soft domination, this masking of evil does indeed owe much to the lie of goodness. Baldwin was famous for calling out this lie. The masquerade of virtuous obedience to civility. Elsewhere, obviously, the choices and consequences are far starker. We've had to bear the knowledge so clearly displayed, for instance, in Rwanda, that a person will take a machete to a neighbor's child when the genocidaire threatened to kill his own child. But while such a person can be seen as being implicated while being a victim, I would not claim that such a person is choosing anything. Whereas in purportedly peaceful democratic societies like our own, where some of us may call out the contradictions posed by murder, incarceration and deprivation of the other, the principle of my life versus your life operates quietly, sanitized of overt violence, as if it were an acceptable and accepted choice. As the dominant principle that enforces all obedience, all regimes of domination, this may appear to us as so abstract that we are led to overlook the key element of what is actually being dissociated, namely fear. It seems necessary to contextualize intersubjectively how fear operates in such regimes of soft domination. It enlists the other to bear it. As in torture, the other must always bear the pain and terror in order that one can oneself be free of it. In psychoanalytic work with imaginary bodies, we use the con concept of projective identification to grasp such forcing of pain and fear into the other. By this, we mean nothing less than a psychic operation that makes it possible to feel as if the other will be the one to die, to absorb pain and death, and to bear the precarious life of fear. Now, where the perpetrator acts this out, the implicated subject merely imagines it. But violence itself also is masked. It wears the mask of the law. When many Americans in the wake of George Floyd's murder finally revolted in horror against the construct of white impunity to make the other suffer, violence was unmasked even more so as protesters were confronted with the retaliatory violence of the political system, exposing our actual lack of agency to modify it, let alone dismantle it. Of course, all systems of domination rely on some mask, even as they depend on the perverse use of the desire for survival, which intensifies the choice between your life and mine. That choice is the oxygen in the poison bloodstream of corruption. Some who comply are rewarded. Some who are deemed unworthy are punished. And thus this choice is perpetuated. It is the aim of perpetrators to ensure that individuals undo their own humanity as the moral third itself is destroyed to make sure there is no other choice than to kill or be killed. This is what we see in overt violent systems 
of domination. Thus, under Pinochet, the security police tortured activists to force them to choose between perishing or saving themselves through betrayal of close relatives and comrades. As if to demonstrate that choosing one's own survival over the tie to others is the only choice. When we protect ourselves by denying that the real life of such choice is actually hell, then we become unwilling party to crime. So it is the acceptance of implicated subjects who are not directly involved in this violence that aids the inscription of this choice of my life over your life. And we have been primed to be helpless in the face of such choices. We have been primed to accept that force and coercion rule, to bear life in a world of doer and done to, all the while producing our own alienation from the sense of lawfulness and agency we believe in, the one on which our claim to democracy is based. What generates submission is sometimes mere self-satisfaction, but often it is fear linked to the reality of a powerlessness that is masked by compliance and its rewards for the privileged concealed by othering those who are subjected to its punishments. Each of these form part of a larger lie about who is worthy of life or grief and who may be left to perish. Sometimes this is not visible in your civilized society. It is only visible if you follow the money into the post-colonial lands where your banks and your institutions cause immense suffering in order to mine necessary minerals, for instance. The metaphor of my life or your life is one way to analyze the fear that prevents acknowledgement of suffering and responsibility for social injuries. And the metaphor I've used to capture this mentality is only one can live. This metaphor unconsciously organizes the struggle for recognition as well as for material survival. And in its ideological form is viewed concretely as fact, reality, not an idea or belief. As Europe has been facing the flood of immigrants from the global South who are disrupted by the very actions of the North used to produce their own wealth, this conflict becomes far more obvious. And suddenly the idea that only one can live becomes overt and obvious. Even though in the modern era, the liberal worldview is supposedly defined by rebellion against authoritarian assumptions, we still see how this underbelly of fear can arise in the moment that the other appears on the horizon. The ideals of equality will then be contradicted by acceptance of a necessary exploitation in which some accumulate and control an overwhelming share of the social wealth produced in the world. Given the reality of ruthless capitalist extraction that has enforced this process and undermines our social solidarity with human beings who are exploited, only one can live is not simply an abstraction. It is something that is now materially embodied in political and social relationships. As psychoanalysts, we need to recognize how the contradictions that are denied by implicated subjects are actually produced by material social relations. Otherwise, we cannot help anyone to become reflective about it. Now, obedience as goodness, as in the days before we had welfare capitalism, 
was reaffirmed as a virtue for the struggling class, while the elite and the elect were allowed to break the rules, to cheat, indeed to be greedy. And this revival of greed in the last 30 or 40 years has been astounding. And it's not merely among the named oligarchs. The exaltation of power and the denigration of neediness was particularly enforced by ideologies of austerity. And these were applied mercilessly to those deemed other. But what this led to was a struggle for scarce resources in the middle of the wealthiest and most resourceful countries of the world. The ideology of discarding the undeserving initially found its negation in a political opposition that upheld the right of the legitimate victim to accuse others of harming and thus establish the moral power to deserve and condemn. However, in the United States, for instance, the moral claims of the victim inevitably had to be recast in terms of doer and done to. Black Lives Matter was deliberately misread as a reversal, signifying a claim to aggress against whites to take and replace. The same ideology, the same fear of replacement now shows itself as a universal characteristic of the right-wing movements throughout the world. Under these conditions, recognition of suffering is perverted into another terrain for competitive struggle rather than a basis for the moral third of more than one can live. On this terrain of do or undone to, we can observe the reversal of splitting that takes the form of the fantasy of being replaced. And now is cast into the idea that some do not deserve to live. It would appear that to admit responsibility for harming or even that harm has been done might invite the danger of being cast out with the mark of Cain. We see this among certain white populations in the United States. My colleague, Ayad El Siraj, the Gazan psychiatrist with whom I organized a project for acknowledgement in the Middle East, argued that the Israelis' guilt at having harmed in order to survive further intensified their already massive fear of being abandoned by the world. If one has lived at the expense of injuring the other, one has forfeited the legitimacy of one's right to live, at least in that thinking. So in order to evade that consequence, it became necessary to argue that one's own people had already suffered more, had already been so justified through suffering that one now could not be accused of doing harm. We see this use of grievance to justify aggression again in so many movements today. In this way, a collective psychic economy is invented in which the moral capital of suffering rules. Whoever suffers most deserves to live may even harm to do so. We can certainly understand then how disidentification with the other suffering can arise through such manic defenses against perceived loss of safety, against danger of being denied recognition, but also a reflective shutdown in the face of pain and fear. Now this reflexive aspect of self-protection cannot be erased by moralizing judgment. That does not help. We must concede that it occurs in all of us, all people, some of the time. However, what clinical experience with manic and grandiose states suggests is that individuals may rationalize their fear of being humiliated or left to suffer 
by their own families, their own community, should they display shameful weakness. And this rationalization takes the form of projecting that the other will become the instrument of that humiliation. This drives the politics of resentment and authoritarianism. Going further, we might interrogate the condition of competition for social recognition in which justice claims risk playing into the dualism in which one group's legitimacy or need can be acknowledged only and precisely by canceling that of the other group. Such deliberate manipulation of fear still plays a great role in how people become implicated in their own and others' domination. This has been a terrible experience for us in the United States in the last years. This pro <clears throat> this manipulation of the idea of the dreaded other as the projected container of aggression, while the violent chaotic behavior of the authoritarian leader who is consciously embraced as protective actually intensifies anxieties of fragmentation and fear of attack, much as the authoritarian father might do. It intensifies the belief in kill or be killed, even if the subject imagines, as many do here, that they will be protected by willingness to use guns. Recognition becomes a social product that is made valuable by scarcity. It is not enough to deserve life and dignity. Someone else must be the undeserving and discarded one. So in the grip of the fantasy that only one can live, white supremacists have imagined that they could ensure their own triumph by dismantling the very social safety net that they need only because it might benefit the other as well. All of this points to the necessity of imagining a different politics that deconstructs the logic of competition for recognition between victims. How do we break the deadlock of subjects <clears throat> who are in this mindset of doer and done to, of struggle between the dignified and discarded. Concrete experience suggests that affirming the third of provision for all to live is a way to appeal to the need for safety and mutual respect and thus to dampen the escalation of such struggles and the attendant dysregulation. However, as we've seen in the United States, when this move is deliberately blocked as a strategy to maintain power, when the third fails to be upheld by social political institutions meant to enforce fairness, the resulting breakdown heightens anxiety about safety. Demagogic appeals to safety and protection from the other have taken the place of social support in my country. And this is, of course, a great danger to us and to the world. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, finish these remarks uh, as I had planned because uh, it seems important for us to have a little bit of time with each other. So in closing, I want to say that the self that does not discard or split off weakness and vulnerability and instead poses a demand for acknowledgement of humanity can dignify suffering. And my experience suggests that this reversal whereby the visage of dignity can disrupt the conventions of power and strength can have a surprising, even electrifying effect. The reclamation of su suffering by the social demand for dignity and respect is a dialectical move in the historic evolution of self-assertion by the oppressed, 
but also in demanding recognition, victims have become agents and transformed those of us who are willing to be so, those implicated subjects who can then embrace their reparative capacity and be moved by insight into the difference between the competitive struggle for recognition and the moral third. Holding that third position means that we are tasked with disrupting the positive identification with the system of domination, even while we continue to be disrupted by others more oppressed than ourselves. To renounce hate and recognize the humanity of the perpetrator is to avoid the reversal of violence in which only one can live. But we need not renounce the rage or outrage that fuels the demand for relationships and a society in which both self and other can deserve to live. This is what remains difficult for us. Finding a third position that serves the indignation that protects the injured without falling into the trap of defending our own righteousness finding a way to embrace conflict and even collision within a larger containing third, an intersubjective process governed by democratic principles in which more than one can live. To overcome the either or mystification of only one can live, we must go through the fire of breakdown and collision. The false goodness of paternalism as we've seen in our own struggles in psychoanalysis, must give way to a more painfully won reciprocity of respect for what we can learn from the unprotected other about destructiveness. To overthrow the old order, its underlying split between the deserving and the discarded must be faced honestly. It is in painful challenges to that order that splits are enacted and become visible. At first, our task is to survive that becoming visible. The political feat is to survive collision, misrecognitions that painfully evoke specific traumas of non-recognition. To hold even in its absence, the vision of a third that contains conflict, provides safety, and gives us a space to expand our mutual recognition and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing your ideas with you. I haven't seen the chat yet. I hope somebody will bring me the tablet. But in the meantime, um, you said, you said some, something that really resonated with me when you linked what you called our claim to goodness as therapists to regulation and, and dysregulation in the therapeutic role, but then also to breaking the cycle between do and done to. And I'm hoping you could say a little bit more. This claim to goodness, which of course we, know we all have, we are therapists, we want to do good. And what happens when we have to participate in the co-constructing of being, becoming the bad, the bad therapist you know, in, the, in the enactment. Yeah? Well, obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, but kind of obviously, uh, and this is such an important question, Tom, uh, this is where our vulnerability comes in. Uh, because the moment that we have to uh, acknowledge that we aren't all good and that we are capable of doing something that is hurtful, it's, it's very easy to become flooded with shame. And, yeah. you know, I think uh, for those of us who work psychoanalytically, it's clear that the field becomes intensely saturated with both people's psyches. And so if the uh, patient in particular is very dysregulated, very agitated by their own traumatic experience, the degree to which we feel ashamed and guilty will be very much heightened. 
And sometimes in that situation, it really becomes almost impossible to think. Uh, and this has been misunderstood, I think, as an attack on thinking or linking. It's not meant by the patient as an attack uh, on thinking. They are simply wildly dysregulated. And they want to be calmed down by knowing that we're good, but they also want to be calmed down by our uh, making clear that we know that we've been bad. So since they can't tolerate that, you know, disjunctive uh, coincidence of good and bad, they're very frightened because it means either they're bad or we are. And that's the impasse that we get into. That's the real do or done to impasse, right? So in that moment, only our ability to be vulnerable and to say, I know that I've done something that made you feel I was bad, but I also sincerely want to repair this. I mean, we don't necessarily use that language, but that's what we're conveying. It means that we're holding the position of the third as best we can. And Thanks, so that idea of good and bad is, is, is of course, an old one, but it, it has a new form here. We have one time just for one more quick question here. Um, here. This is from the chat. Correct me if I misunderstand. If we deny, do we suffer less? By deny, I presume dissociate. Do we suffer less? Well, that depends. Some people seem to be able to deny and dissociate and not suffer. And it's easy to admire those who do so. Uh, of course, bearing in mind that those people are dangerous. Uh, and those who dissociate the most often achieve positions uh, of being admired um, because they are able to uh, embrace domination. Uh, so when we say, do we suffer less? I think it depends on where you position yourself or where you are positioned socially, whether you suffer less from denial and dissociation. I would argue that the, uh, the precariat, the struggling classes, the people without actual social power um, continue to suffer even when they try to dissociate. Whereas it seems that what characterizes uh, people who really have succeeded in uh, dominating and originating systems of domination is that they are able to split off that suffering and project it into the other whom they then cause to suffer. And of course, we see this in America in the police. Thank you so much, Jessica. We have to come to an end. The chat is full of praise and thank yous. 